Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor to talk to you the, uh, uh, this morning, uh, especially since of all the speakers I looked through the list, I'm probably the one who had the least exposure to Murray Rothbard. In fact, I met him only once. Uh, I looked up the date. Uh, it was uh, November 26, 1994. Okay. Uh, that was uh, when uh, I had just was in, in the proce uh, process of finishing my doctoral dissertation, and uh, it was uh, an Austrian uh, dissertation which did not find much applause from my research director. So, my uh, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, is, is Natalie here. She had the good sense as well. Maybe you should get in touch with people who actually like what you're doing. <laughs> so. She she sent me to to the U.S. So I took part in this this conference it was 1994. Uh, the, the, it was a, a conference in honor of Henry Hazlitt's hundredth birthday. He had died the year before at the age of 99 uh, in the in Essex House, and uh, uh, it was, was the closest place I could get to, to the U.S. So I I went there. I was under very adventurous circumstances. I flew with Pakistan Airlines, and because I did have no budget, I stayed in Harlem. Uh, 125th Street and Lennox. Okay, yeah. So, so when you're young, you have no money. You need to be a risk taker. When, when you're old, and you, you, other factors that come into place. Um, so that was the the only time I met him, and I'll say a few words uh, later on about this. And uh, actually, but I have one connection that is much much stronger than any of the other speakers uh, to to Rothbard, which is that I possess his tie. Right, so this is. This is a relic, this is a Rothbard relic. It's his uh, wife, Joanne, who gave it to me. Uh, Walter Block, he had, yes, they had this joke when we were sitting in the bus and said, well, uh, I actually sh shook Mises' hand and I, I didn't wash it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you come and shake my hand, you'll have, have the touch with me. Then he went to the washroom and said, now I've washed it, now it's too late. Right? Uh, well, I didn't shake, uh, well, I shook uh, Rothbard's hand and, but I also got his tie from, from his wife for reasons which we cannot fully explain. But I mean, she must have had a good sense uh, must, yeah, yeah. to give it to me rather than you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, here. It's, uh, uh, as in for an ac academic, it's rather rare to have the opportunity to speak to non academics because this is what academ academics do most of the time to talk to each other. On, on subjects that interest uh, about five people in the world. Uh, of course, sometimes you have a different setting, uh, academics talk at political rally rallies and so on, but this is also not quite the same thing because at political rallies or political parties and so on are actually large movements to uh, rip off other people. Right? So it's, there's no uh, personal commitment, there's no uh, contribution, uh, people don't uh, start at the wrong end, right? They want that everybody else changes or that everybody else pays them, rather than starting with themselves and ask themselves, what could I do uh, personally to make this place, this world a better place? And that's, of course, the right thing to do. And it's for me, it's a great honor. And I'm always awestruck if I look at individual careers of other people who are in this room, uh, what they've accomplished in their, in their lives. And on top of this, <laughs> you are interested in uh, the foundation of a free society, which are ideas, and you are ready to commit to to help uh, institutions, especially the Mises Institute, who is the foremost institution in the defense of uh, what we cherish so much, uh, namely a free society. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my talk uh, is supposed to, to deal with uh, how Rothbard crosses the pond, or how Rothbard has crossed be be the pond, because as a matter of fact, today Rothbard is known all over the world, and there are young people uh, reading Rothbard, studying Rothbard, and uh, especially, that's the most important thing, developing right? uh, the ideas of Rothbard, criticizing Rothbard, uh, applying uh, uh, Rothbard's uh, ideas to, to new problems, uh, uh, solving the problems of our day. One of the worst things that can happen to an intellectual movement is that it turns into some sort of a museum. Right? So you, you just look at the great master and says, oh, yes, and you roll out the, the prayer carpet and, and say, yes, yes, great master. And you, you don't tolerate the slightest deviance from the recital of, of the words of the great master and so on. That's a sure sign of brain death, right? So you're close. Uh, and we don't have this. This is one of the wonderful things of uh, uh, the Mises Institute and uh, the movement at the center of which it is 
that we don't have this kind of problem. So Rothbard is today all over the world. How did it come? What were the circumstances that brought this about? Uh, yeah, so here again, I can relate a little bit out of my own experience in 1994, but I'll say a few words of, of how the world was in 1994 and how the world was uh, before 1994. So in my own case, I did not come to Austrian economics through uh, uh, Rothbard. I came uh, to Austrian economics through Mises. And I did not discover Mises in Germany, where I was uh, born and, and did my studies, but in uh, France, out of all places. Okay, so France is rather more social, socialistic, both in intellectual orientation and in uh, actual policy than, than Germany. But I, uh, but I had the good fortune, it was probably an accident, uh, but I had the good fortune anyway to, to study for a year in France. And uh, I was studying with an economist who was um, a very enthusiastic um, pedagogue in, in the good sense of the word. So he understood his main task, not as inculcating any predefined ideas into our heads, but in raising enthusiasm uh, in our minds for research. He wanted to have us do carry on research and uh, develop the science and so on in whatever field uh, uh, we, we might be attracted to. This is very rare. But so I had the good fortune coming on this man, and he was very curious, great intellectual curiosity, he was not an Austrian at all, but he had read, his name was Claude Courtois, and he died shortly after I met him. Um, he uh, had me read uh, uh, two books that had been published in, uh, in France, in French translations at the time, uh, one of which was a book with essays by Mary Rothbard, believe it or not, 1991, so there was this book, uh, that had the title uh, Economist et Charlatan, Economists and Charlatans. Okay. <laughs> well, it was not Rothbard who made up this title, it was the translator. Uh, it's a man uh, with the name of François Guillaume, who is still around. He's a very anti idiosyncratic person. But uh, he had discovered Rothbard in the 1980s and had become an enthusiastic uh, follower and promoter of Rothbard's thought in France. And Francois is a, is a very um, brilliant, uh, brilliant man. He has a, a very wide-ranging interest. He is a, a, a splendid uh, um, a speaker and uh, had an enormous outburst of uh, uh, energy in, in the 1980s and 1990s in tr translating I don't know how many books. But among uh, uh, these books was this one by Rothbard, which contained essays such as uh, Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics, a few essays on the epistemology of, of uh, economics and, and things like this. So this was my first exposure to Rothbard. My first exposure to Austrian economics, uh, so, so it came there. But this not, did not make me an Austrian, it, it, it spiked my interest. So then I would went on, uh, go on to read uh, Hayek and uh, then I discovered Mises. And Mises was uh, 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 somebody who uh, impressed me uh, very strongly because Mises had this depth that is so absent uh, in most of the economics profession because he reaches from the epistemological foundations to the applications uh, of the theory. So it's the entire corpus of economic theory and then with various applications, uh, but build on a philosophical foundation, which, he, uh, which is original also with him. So this I didn't know at the time, but I, I sensed this depth. So when I started off my doctoral studies, I would read Mises in more detail. And when I read his theory of money and credit, this would convert me and make, make me an, uh, an Austrian economist. I said, well, I only want to do research based on this because this, for some strange reason, has been neglected in the science, right? Where people just don't know it. For some reason, it has been forgotten. And all I, this is a huge opportunity, a huge uh, market niche for me. Right? Because uh, all the other people have uh, simply, they, they ignore this. All I need to do is, well, to tell them this is how it is and all doors will flung open because this is the right approach. <laughs> yeah, so it was a little bit naive. Um, but in any case, so this was what went into Austrian economics. And then when I studied Mises more systematically, once I was through uh, his major work, then I started tackling the other authors, so I came to Rothbard. And uh, so I still remember how I, I, I took uh, many economists state out of the university bookshelves because the book was present at several university libraries uh, in, uh, in, in Germany, uh, at the Technical University in Berlin, where I was, there was a copy. So I, I took the book and I spent uh, quite a substantial uh, time 
reading it, and then I put it back on the on the shelves, uh, very irritated and also slightly in, in, in disgust. Because Rothbard, he had this very weird way of tackling uh, economics. He would, in the second chapter of the book, he would suddenly talk about property rights. Okay, no economist does this. No economist talk talks about. I mean, the, today we have a discipline called law and economics, so there sometimes you talk about property rights, but only to explain how property rights should be, from an economic point of view. Right, so you should give property rights to those people who maximize social welfare or whatever coming out of this. It's a very perverse uh, way of thinking about property rights. So Rothbard has this there in this book, and I was completely unprepared to even consider the the. Uh, the merit that this might have in, in an economics book. And then, of course, there was this political radicalism, which was very shocking to me. I mean, I was a good European, after all. I was uh, pretty much a social democrat. And uh, then in, in Mises, uh, of course, in Human Action, he talks about uh, the consequences of government interventionism, but uh, uh, you wouldn't get the impression that he's... Uh, uh, libertarian or some libertarian agenda, but in Rothbard it's pretty strong. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, this shocked me uh, as well. So I was not prepared to, well, uh, uh, to, to base my readings and my research on Rothbard, but I returned to him a few years later. I think the situation was similar for most people uh, at the time. And the reason is, is, is uh, 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 rooted in a very, very simple psychological fact that uh, if you have somebody um, propounding views that are unconventional and especially uh, lead to political con conclusions that are unfamiliar, you are likely to reject it on the ground simply to say, well, this, if this had any merit, then it would be better not. Right? Of course, this is a circular reasoning, right? It's like the old Groucho Marx uh, joke, right? I would never join a club that would exact me as a member. Um, it's a, a little similar there. Uh, but, but still, right, there is a sort of conviction that comes with success. Right? When you see, okay, there are professors who actually do not consider it to be nonsense, but who take this seriously and who, who build on it, that's a completely different thing. If there are institutes, uh, uh, research institutions, who are... Uh, actively discussing this and teaching this to students is a very different thing. But this didn't exist in 1994. It only existed a few years later. So by 1994, there were very few Rothbardians, of course, also in the US, but uh, even, even less outside of Europe. Some people had found their way uh, accidentally to, to Rothbard um, uh, because they had for some reason known about Austrian economics and then went to the United States to study there. Uh, one early example is uh, Hans Zenos, right, who became a professor in, in Grove City College. And he went to uh, the United States because he didn't, couldn't imagine building a career, building a life in Germany after, after the war. Uh, and the only thing he had heard, he had studied economics and got a doctorate degree in, in Cologne, at the University of Cologne, that the only thing he had heard about Austrian economics was, well, well there's this Mises guy who is a sharp Jew. <laughs> sounds rather pleonastic, but well, anyway. And, uh, and, and, and another example is, is a Frenchman, uh, none of uh, whom you don't know is, is a good friend of mine, Philippe Nataf. So he went uh, to, to France uh, in the late 1960s and he studied with Zenolz at Grove City College and then got a doctoral de degree with, with, with Zenolz. He also taught at the Summer University about 15 years ago. Yeah. And, and Hans Hoppe, uh, of course. So Hans Hoppe discovered uh, Mises independently uh, in the, in the mid-1970s. Uh, there was nobody there to... to uh, there was no classes on Mises. There was no... Uh, 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 seminars in Austrian economics, no conferences, and so on. And he, well, uh, by, by some references uh, that he found in, uh, in the academic literature, so found his way to Mises, and then from there to, to, to Rothbard eventually. So there were no uh, conferences, there was no organization, uh, no associations, right? Um, there were, of course, libertarians in, in a wider sense uh, in Europe, but they were most strongly influenced uh, by, by Hayek, uh, not by Mises. 
for reasons which, after all, are quite superficial, but so the, they were there. They, it's simply because Hayek got a Nobel Prize in 1974. So this uh, uh, carried a lot of weight. It's again the uh, success, uh, the conviction that comes with uh, success. Right. And uh, there were uh, institutions uh, such as, uh, well, there was in, 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 in Prague, uh, it was a, a Liberalian Institute, which was created after 1989. Uh, at the same time, there was also uh, in, in Vilnius and in Lithuania, a libertarian think tank was, was created. But all of these, initially at least, they were very strongly under the influence of, of Hayek rather than of Mises. And of, if not under the influence of Mises, then of course certainly not under the influence of, uh, uh, of Rothbard. Right. So, uh, by the early 1990s, there were various beginnings, uh, especially under the wake of the collapse of socialism, but there was no, Rothbard has not, had not yet crossed the pond. Rather, what happened rather was that those who liked Rothbard crossed the pond, or had crossed the pond, and had come to the United States. So I, I think I was one of the first who uh, crossed the pond uh, in, the, in the other direction and uh, started uh, spreading Rothbard's idea, because that's, by 1994, I had become convinced, contrary to my earlier readings, that Rothbard indeed was the true heir of Mises, as Professor Salerno has just explained to us, and that he has a lot of important things to, uh, to tell us that should be known by a wide public. That moreover, Rothbard has qualities that Mises did not have, uh, one of which is the brilliant ability as a writer. Rothbard has this very rare ability among uh, uh, economists, but academics more generally, that he has great depth and great clarity. And you know that very often uh, depth uh, and, and clarity are supposed not to go uh, together, right? So people look into the ground, they say, well, this must be shallow because I see to the ground. And if they look at some, some uh, muddy pond, they think, well, it must be deep because I cannot see to the ground. It uh, doesn't mean that there might be not some waters that are both muddy and deep, but of course they're not very interesting because you spend most of your time filtering, right? Uh, so in Rothbard you have this, you have this depth and you have uh, great, great clarity. So it's, it's, uh, it's an enormously powerful tool to spread uh, the ideas of uh, uh, libertarian philosophy and the, the virtues of a free society that we have with Rothbard's writings. So returning then back to, to Europe, I uh, translated two works into German that uh, had not been, I think it was the first two German uh, Rothbard tra uh, translations. I translated The Ethics of Liberty, and I translated What Has Government Done to Our Money? And both books are still in print, The Ethics of Liberty, the German edition is in the third edition, uh, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money? It has a very nice title, it's The Scheingeld System, The Fake Money System. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually, it's a wordplay because the word shine, right? It means both a uh, note, it's a note, but it also means just outer appearance, right? Appearance. So it's a shine geld, uh, the, the appearance money system, the fake money system. And uh, so this is in the fifth, uh, fifth edition. And both books since then, right? So uh, have been translated in, uh, into what are 10 other European uh, languages. So they're made their round. The big, but of course, uh, this is nothing, right? So this, this would not have spread uh, Rothbard's idea significantly in Europe and across the rest of the world. What really brought, uh, turned things around was the, uh, was the rise of the internet. So as from 1995. The rise of the internet combined with great entrepreneurship in the, uh, among the leaders of the Mises Institute, of course, Lou Rockwell in, in particular. Lou Rockwell uh, immediately seized on, on this opportunity and, and uh, built the communication strategy of the, of the Mises Institute on the internet and also created his own uh, separate uh, enterprise, Um Then there was uh, Jeff Tucker at the time working for the Institute, who was a, a, a splendid, a, a genius uh, of marketing, and he understood all the possibilities that came with uh, using the internet as a communications tool. So this is what really what boosted uh, the the presence of, of the Mises Institute, and the ideas of Rothbard, Mises, uh, Hopper, Salerno, and, and, and so on, all over the world. And, and this is what then also a greatly increased our attractiveness for foreign students uh, to, uh, to our teaching programs. Right? So um, 
I don't know exactly what the composition was of, of the Mises Summer University by 1992, but probably it was something like 80% Americans, right? right? And some 20% um, uh, foreigners. And by the time I had uh, uh, joined the crowd, so we're talking about 1996, 97, so the first year of the internet, we already had almost half of the people coming from abroad. And today we have so many people applying for the summer university from outside of the US that it's impossible for us to take them all. Okay. Plus we have these teaching programs in which we, uh, we have taught and will continue to teach the professors of tomorrow all over the world. Right? So we have the uh, graduate program for doctoral students during the summer, people coming to the Mises Institute and they're spending two months on, on their research projects. And uh, out of this program that we have created in 1999, uh, I don't know how many, uh, literally dozens of professors who have uh, turned out of the, this program who are teaching today, not only in the US, but all over the rest of the, the place. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is how finally Rothbard crossed the pond, um, right? So we had both conditions. We had this brilliant writer who just was not uh, largely uh, acknowledged uh, enough and who finally uh, uh, obtained the audience that he deserved so much and in exchange gave to the world all that he had to give uh, in, in, uh, with his, uh, with, with his uh, books and with, with his articles, and thereby contributed to, well, to a better world, I think, also thanks to your help. Thank you very much. Thank you.